All right. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, all my endoscopy nurses and uh, technicians as well as trainees. And we are going to cover esophageal anatomy that is relevant to endoscopy. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Stolein for his mentorship and support, Mr. Charles Butt for his HEB grant that allows us to do this work, and Ms. Angela Deal, uh, who is an excellent medical illustrator. Uh, she has drawn all the diagrams that you'll be seeing here, and uh, Sanji Suresh, who has been working on the endoscopy tech training program. So here is uh, a picture uh, where we are doing endoscopy. And uh, we do endoscopy to evaluate esophagus for several different uh, reasons. Uh, one is if somebody comes in with heartburn, acid regurgitation, that is GERD, if they have difficulty swallowing, that is dysphagia, or painful swallowing, that is odonophagia. Or if somebody comes in with bleeding, that is uh, vomiting of blood or hematemesis. And finally, we see uh, some patients with uh, cancer. Actually, I should say at Anderson, we see a lot of patients with cancer. And in cancer, we do a lot of things. We do screening and we do a screening for cancer in patients with Barrett's esophagus. We diagnose cancer and we stage cancer. That's what uh, Dr. Lee and his group does. And we treat cancer. Uh, that is Dr. Martha Davila, Amina Shafi. They do a lot of uh, Barrett's uh, cancer treatment. And finally, we do palliation. That is somebody who is not doing well and we put a stent. So that there are different things we, we do. As part of this, I want to share with you the relevance of the esophageal anatomy. So for somebody who is new to endoscopy, uh, this is what happens when, you, when somebody does an endoscopy. The endoscope takes a path. It goes from the mouth into the buccal cavity and into the pharynx. So now, now we are in the midst of COVID. And if you look at patients getting a, a screening for COVID, they take a swab from the pharynx, either nasopharynx or oropharynx. And then the scope goes down and uh, looks at the larynx and goes behind the larynx through the upper esophageal sphincter and then behind the trachea, aortic arch, and uh, behind the heart. And then it comes down and it goes from the chest into the abdomen through the diaphragm the, to the diaphragm and the opening of the diaphragm is called the hiatus and then it enters into the stomach so you see a lot of things as we go through this uh, uh, process so say for example we've gone from the mouth into the uh, pharynx we look at the larynx and the larynx has so many different areas and we should be actually screening the larynx if possible if the patient allows us. So this is the larynx. And here is the epiglottis. As you can see here, that's the pole that prevents us from aspirating. It closes the larynx. And you have two poles here. And when somebody has acid reflux and uh, they say, my throat is tight, and this is the area that can get inflamed, the, the erythenoids, right? And then on the side of the larynx, you have this recess on both sides. That is the pyriform fossa. And as you can see here, you, the vocal cords. So when we do endoscopy, we go from here, we can go behind the larynx and enter the esophagus. But that's not what we do. We go straight and take a path into the uh, pyriform fossa and then go underneath the larynx to the center, either on the right side or on the left side, all right? So once you go uh, down the larynx, uh, down the, uh, behind the pyriform fossa, you reach the upper esophageal sphincter, 
Uh, it has a lot of uh, thick uh, skeletal muscle, and we'll talk about it later uh, about the importance of this. And then as you go down, you're behind the trachea, and this is upper one third of the esophagus, and behind the uh, uh, heart, middle one third of the esophagus. And then as you come down, you go through the diaphragm and then uh, reach the uh, reach the lower esophageal sphincter. So we will talk a lot about this lower esophageal sphincter, which is important for uh, all endoscopies. Okay. So when we do endoscopy, we make a lot of measurements. And what do these measurements mean? So the first thing is the endoscopists say either Z line or squamo columnar junction. So what is a Z line or a squamo columnar junction? So the esophagus is lined by squamous lining. The stomach is lined by columnar lining. And the junction between the esophagus between the squamous lining and the columnar lining, that is the squamo-columnar junction. So that's one measurement that we take. The next one is gastroesophageal junction. So what is a gastroesophageal junction? So when you look at the esophagus, you put your scope here and you wait for some inspiration, expiration to happen and then you can see the folds of the stomach. The top of the folds of the stomach is what is called gastroesophageal junction. So normal people have squamocolonar junction, gastroesophageal junction at about the same uh, distance. So when we say 40 centimeters uh, Z line, 40 centimeters G junction, that's what you're talking about. The next one is esophagus goes through the diaphragm into the stomach. So this is the opening through which the esophagus goes down. As you know, when we breathe, the diaphragm contracts and you watch for the pinching of the diaphragm on the esophagus. That's what is called the diaphragm pinch, or that's where the hiatus is. So we talked about squamocolonar junction, gastroesophageal junction, and hiatus. So let us take a case. So say for example, uh, Dr. Davala says, okay, the Z line is at 40 centimeters, gastroesophageal junction is at 40 centimeters, and the hiatus is at 40 centimeters. You know, when you record this, you should get into your mind that we are dealing with a normal GA junction and there is no Barrett's esophagus. I'll explain this in a little bit. And there is no hiatal hernia. All right, so let us take a, another example of Barrett's esophagus. So when they say the Z line is at 36 centimeters, G junction at 38 centimeters and hiatus at 40 centimeters. So what do, what do they mean? So the, if you look at it, so this is the squamocolumnar area and that is the squamocolumnar junction that is at 36 centimeters. And then as you come down, the gastric folds are coming at 38 centimeters and the diaphragmatic pinch is at 40 centimeters. So 36, 38, and 40 centimeters. The difference from the G junction to the squamous columnar junction is about 38 to 36 is two centimeters. That is the Barrett's esophagus. And then from the hiatus to the G junction, that is two centimeters of hiatal hernia. So this patient has an abnormal G junction, has two centimeter Barrett's esophagus and two centimeter hiatal hernia. So nurses, when they are measuring this, 
noting down the measurements, you have to get into this mindset of what the patient has so that uh, you can uh, appreciate better uh, about uh, this uh, uh, patient's problem. So there is a little more finer detail that I want to share in terms of the Barrett's esophagus, uh, how everybody around the world try to measure. So we talked about uh, G junction, uh, Z line, G junction, hiatal hernia. Sometimes we talk about the top or the Barrett's tongue. So here the Barrett's tongue is at 35, Z line at 36, G junction at 38, and hiatus at 40. So let's look at this one a little further. So as you come down the esophagus, you see this uh, Barrett's tongue, the top is at 35 centimeters. The rest are the same, 36, 38. What does this mean? So what we do is we look at the Barrett's in terms of the circumferential extent and the maximum extent. The maximum extent is from the G junction all the way to the top of the tongue. That is 38 minus 38 minus 33 is about three centimeters. So the maximum extent M is three. We put it as M3. And then you have completely circumferential area from here all the way to the bottom of this squamous junction uh, from 38 to 36. That is the circumferential extent or C2. So once you've uh, learned this, so uh, when we put the report, we say Barrett's esophagus and we say C2, M3. This is what we take from here to make that, uh, uh, to make, uh, to document the uh, classification. So around the world, if you say C2, M3, people would know how extensive is the Barrett's. It could be C3, M5, so that means three centimeters circumferential, five centimeters is the maximum tongue all the way to the top. So you, you get that, right? Okay. So the next is wall structure and function. So this is a very important concept to understand. So you can see the esophagus and uh, you see this is the mucosa. And then the mucosa is uh, lies on muscularis mucosa. That's a small amount of muscle fiber that separates the mucosa from the submucosa. Submucosa has blood vessels. And that's where the varices lie. That's where we do the banding. The submucosa has these vessels and nerves. And then you have the muscularis propria, and finally, adventitia. The wall structure is the same from esophagus all the way to the rectum. The only thing is, uh, instead of adventitia, we call the serosa in the stomach and intestines and colon. So when you look at mucosa, right, that's the inside lining that we see. And the, the problems with mucosa are, if somebody has acid reflux and damage, it's limited to the mucosa. If you have Barrett's, it is limited to the mucosa. And if it is early cancer, it is limited to the mucosa. When it comes to submucosa, it has these vessels, and these, these vessels become big, they become varices, and they bleed. And then outside the vessels, you have the muscularis propria, or the muscle. And the muscle is important for your swallowing when the food goes down. And if there is a problem with the motility, the food doesn't go down. A classic example is achalasia, right? We do achalasia balloon dilation. We do manometry to check for achalasia. And outside is the adventitia. We are in a cancer center. We see a lot of people with either breast cancer, lung cancer, with a lot of uh, uh, lymph nodes uh, pressing on outside and causing obstruction of the esophagus. 
So these are the concepts you want to keep in mind when you think about the esophagus, think about uh, mucosa, what's the problem, submucosa, muscularis propria, adventitia. So you got that, right? Okay. So for us in the cancer center, we need to know what is surrounding the esophagus in terms of planning our stenting. So let me take you through this. So here is the uh, thoracic cavity. And this is the inlet or called the thoracic inlet. On the front side or anterior side, you have the sternum. That's the sternum. On the back side or the posterior side, you have the spine. That's the spine, all right? And then below, you have the diaphragm. So you have all these structures that uh, are the boundaries of the thoracic cavity. So the esophagus comes from the neck, it goes into the thorax, and then goes through the diaphragmatic hiatus and enters into the stomach here. So in the upper one third, you have trachea. So in the upper one third, there is trachea. So say for example, you have an esophageal cancer patient or somebody with esophageal obstruction, and they say the obstruction is high up, then you have to ask yourself, what is happening to the trachea? Is there a large mass pressing on the trachea or not? If it is pressing on the trachea and you come here and put a stent, what happens is the patient may develop a code because once the stent expands, it presses on the, on the trachea and then you have problems with breathing. So that is something to keep in mind for us in the cancer center. Where is the cancer? Is it in the upper one third, middle one third or lower one third? And whether it is pressing on the trachea or on the bronchus. Okay, as the esophagus goes down, it is behind the heart and it is adjacent to the aorta. So why is this important? So if you look at a cardiologist, they do TEE, -E -E, trans esophageal echocardiogram. So what they do is they bring they bring their uh, they bring their echo endoscope and then examine the heart. So if somebody is having a mitral valve replacement or some other thing that's been happening, they put an echo endoscope and they see what is happening to the valve as the guy is trying to uh, place the valve using the minimally invasive approaches. So something to keep in mind, okay. And then as it comes down, it is adjacent to the aorta. One of the things you have to keep in mind is if the tumor is already invading the aorta, right? And you put a stent, people have reported that the stents actually expand, go out of the esophagus and they enter into the aorta and people have died from massive bleeding. So something to keep in mind. Okay, so we talked about the anatomy. Now we talk about the vascular anatomy because we do a lot of banding. In terms of arterial supply, unlike uh, ulcer bleeding, esophageal ulcer bleeding is very rare. And esophageal ischemia is rare because esophagus gets blood supply from multiple vessels, thyroid branches, bronchial branches, aortic branches, and from the celiac trunk, it goes to the left gastric artery and supplies. It has lots of supplies. So ischemia is not of a big problem in the esophagus. But our main problem is varices. So let's talk about varices. So you see the heart. The heart drains from the neck and upper limbs through the superior vena cava and from the lower limbs, uh, kidneys, uh, pelvis from the inferior vena cava. So the heart has superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. Then we look at the liver. The liver is supplied by an artery and a vein, and the vein is a portal vein. 
and it gets blood supply from the colon, that is inferior mesenteric artery, mesenteric vein, and then from the small intestine uh, by superior mesenteric vein, and from the spleen, splenic vein. They all join, they go down here, and they make branches, and then the blood goes back into the hepatic veins and back in. What is important is the esophagus drainage, part of it goes up into the superior, superior vena cava, part of it goes through the portal vein and then goes through the inferior mesenteric vein. So if there is a blockage here or in the hepatic veins, what happens is the blood actually drains from the liver through the left gastric vein esophageal vein and up. So if you have like an I-45 block and then you have to take a side road, all these things become big. And those actually are the ones that turn into varices. So let's uh, look at it in a little more detail here. So you have the inferior vena cava, you have a normal liver, and you have the portal vein, all right? The blood is going from the intestines and the spleen and goes in, and then in, this, in, the, in the liver, uh, these are the portal vein changes, portal vein radicals, and they go through, central vein, through the central vein, and from here, hepatic vein and up. All right. So the blood is going from below up. What happens when you have cirrhosis, right? This is a liver disease, it is irreversible. And then the pressure in the liver increases and the blood actually, instead of going through the liver into the hepatic veins and up, it actually backflows. When it backflows, we talked about left gastric vein, esophageal vein, and then goes through the azygous and then into the superior vena cava. Because there's too much of blood that these small vessels can take, they become varices, all right. So let's talk about varices a little more. So here is the esophagus wall. On this side, we set up the normal, and this side is the varices. So let's look at it. So veins drain the blood. And, uh, and this, is, this one we actually magnified here. We have the mucosa, this is the esophageal wall. This is the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis propria, and this, is, this should be actually adventitious, okay. So the mucosal vessels are small vessels, very small. And then they go down into superficial venous plexus that is in the submucosa. And then they go through the perforating veins into the veins outside the esophagus. So the blood keeps going like this, like this, like this, and then goes into the heart, or goes into the liver, okay. When there is portal hypertension, the blood actually tries to take this bypass route of this uh, vein surrounded. And as you come here, as the blood flow increases, these uh, adventitial veins become bigger, perforating veins become bigger, and the venous plexus in the submucosa become bigger. These are what we see as varices. And then the vessels inside the mucosa, when they become bigger, they are seen as red spots or hemocystic spots. When you see the hemostatic spot, there's very little lining. And this is a bad sign. That means the patient is going to bleed. So when you see this, we end up uh, taking banding to control this. One thing is important is in, when you put a band, if you put the band very close to the GE junction, you are more likely to get the perforating veins. And if you get the perforating veins as well, you have less chance of these varices from coming back. So we talked about varices. Now let's talk about uh, cross-sectional anatomy relevant to our cancer center. So we do EUS, that is endoscopic ultrasound. So there are a couple of ways we can check. Uh, one is the radial scope, where the plane is 
plane is uh, across, as you can see, and uh, you're looking at the esophageal wall to see how far deep the cancer has gone, and you're also looking at uh, lymph nodes. So from the look of the lymph nodes, you can say whether there's cancer or not. Say, for example, Dr. Jeffley says the lymph node is oval, irregular, and uh, a little bit indefined. That is a benign lymph node. On the other hand, when cancer gets in here, this becomes round, well demarcated. You can see the boundaries clearly, and then uh, hypoechoid. So when he says that, that's the uh, lymph node that he's going to biopsy. You should not biopsy a lymph node going through here. You should biopsy from a free uh, uninvolved area. So let's talk about it. So when you do the linear echo endoscope, it, is, it goes parallel to the wall. And then as you can see, we are taking a, a biopsy. So the key is when you're biopsying, go through normal wall. Otherwise, if you go from here, you're going to catch these cells and you don't know whether the lymph node is positive or not. So when we do in Anderson, a lymph node biopsy, Dr. Lee, uh, Dr. Ross, Dr. Botani, uh, Brian and Emmanuel and G, what they're doing is they're looking at the lymph node and they're picking the highest lymph node uh, uh, above the cancer. The reason is when you find that, okay, at, at uh, 22 centimeters, you find a lymph node that is positive, that will help the radi radiotherapist to extend the radiation all the way to include these lymph nodes. So that's the concept. So let's look at the esophageal anatomy in terms of cancer. So this is the lumen. And then you can see the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis propria, adventitia, and then surrounding iota. This is the most important diagram we should keep in mind. So when you have cancer that is uh, just limited to the mucosa, it doesn't go beyond the muscularis mucosa, that is intramucosal cancer. Intramucosal cancer. When it goes beyond the mucosa, that is invasive cancer. Why is this important? Intramucosal cancer, endoscopists can take care. Invasive cancer needs surgery because by the time it goes into the submucosa, it has already gone out into the lymph nodes. So that's the reason we should be picking up these cancers very early. So here, as you look at it, so this cancer has gone from the mucosa to submucosa. This is stage one. And it's gone into the muscle, the muscularis propria, that is stage two. And then it's gone out, that is stage three. And then it's reached the adjacent vessels like iota, pleura, or whatever, adjacent vessels, that is stage four. So as you can see here, as the cancer is getting bigger and bigger, the lumen is getting smaller and smaller. So when somebody has difficulty swallowing, they have difficulty swallowing when the lumen becomes less than 13 millimeters, 13 millimeters. And when they have difficulty swallowing, they already had stage three cancer. So not sure whether you should dilate because when you dilate, if you rupture, you are actually spreading the cancer. So it's very important to uh, be careful when you're staging because the EUS scope is bigger. So in addition to that, when they are looking at the cancer, they're looking at all these lymph nodes and trying to pick the highest lymph node for biopsy. So we talked about different things and I want to talk about one thing. The esophageal lumen is about 20 to 25 millimeters in size. And uh, as the cancer develops, this lumen becomes smaller. And that's why you need to know 
the scope, right, picking the right scope for the anatomy. So the, the, the scope diameter changes from one scope to the other. Uh, as you can see, we all know about the gastroscopes. The biggest size is about 10.9. Depending upon the company, the size of the scope changes. Uh, ERCP scope is bigger than the gastroscope. And then US scope uh, is even bigger. So when somebody is having difficulty swallowing uh, with cancer, uh, they probably already have stage, stage three cancer. And uh, you know, when you think about it, uh, you should ask, okay, why are we doing, is the patient having difficulty swallowing? What scopes do you need? And uh, all those things. So here I'm going to stop. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Dr. Raju, yeah. Question. When you start, when you take the measurement for the esophagus, like the G junction, uh, squamous columnar, and um, diaphragmatic hiatus, do you take it while you're going in, while you're coming out? I think uh, the most important thing is I, I don't think people have defined when you should take the measurements, right? People have. Uh, uh, the one thing is you want to make sure you take the measurements when the patient is not coughing, retching, and other things. That's one. The second one is uh, probably better if you get into the habit and say, I'm going to take measurements either going in or out. Uh, but when you take measurements, there are a couple of things. One is you have to spend time to define the gastroesophageal junction. And sometimes we underestimate the gastroesophageal junction. That means we overestimate the Barrett's esophagus, right? So in order to do that, it's important to put in some puffs of air and also decompress the uh, esophagus or suction uh, so that the folds are a little more prominent and then measure that. Uh, what do people do uh, at UT Houston? So some people, um, like few attendings, they love uh, to take it while you're going in. Some will always say take it while you're going out, and that's why you would see a different. In my, you see a difference in measurement. Like for example, Doctor Erkan likes to take the measurements while he's going in. Okay. Okay. Uh, so he said because if you have a hiatal hernia or something, and you go in down to the duodenum, the hiatal hernia may get so smaller because you're pushing the scope, you may push the stomach down a little bit and then you stretch the hernia. So that's why I was asking that. Right. I, I think that it, you're, you're right. Uh, the thing is, uh, when it comes to hiatal hernia, uh, there is going to be a change uh, depending upon uh, when you're going to take the measurements, right? It, it does make a difference, Small, a little bit smaller, or a little bit bigger. But for us, uh, uh, who are involved with uh, Barrett's uh, screening and Barrett's surveillance. Uh, once you define the top of the gastric fold, uh, that is the most important measurement. Uh, Squamacolmar junction is relatively easy to find, and you should be able to come up with between you know, 0.5 to 1 centimeter variation. I'm sure there is some variation when you're measuring, uh, but still, the key is for Barrett's is, is it a short segment or is it a long segment, right? In terms of the outcomes. Yes. Yeah. I'm still struggling how to play with this uh, Zoom, just bear with me. I don't know whether I can unmute or you guys can unmute yourself. All right, okay, all right. Dr. Raju, this is Asmeen. So a uh, general question. 
how high can you go or do you go from the G junction when you're banding varices? What's the highest you go? So the, actually, it's, uh, ask me if you can actually pull, pull an article. Uh, uh, the guy's name is Kitano, K-I-T-A-N-O. Uh, he's a Japanese, uh, one of the senior Japanese endoscopists. I think, I believe he was a immediate past president of the society. And uh, he did some fascinating work when he, when he went to do his PhD in South Africa, uh, I believe with Ted Blanche, or Ted Blanche. So what they did was they injected resin into cadaver uh, venous, esophageal venous system and they looked at the anatomy of the esophageal varices. And that uh, article, I wish you could uh, pick it up and read, uh, that came probably way back in the uh, 80s, 1980s. Uh, I was really fascinated by that work. It's one of the most beautiful pieces of uh, anatomy uh, ever described. Uh, so when you look at that paper, he talks about these concepts that I talked about, intraepithelial vessels uh, that, that become the hemocystic spots, uh, superficial venous plexus, perforating veins, and the adventitial veins. That all concept came from his work. So coming back to your question, uh, the, a lot of the perforating veins uh, happen at the close to the cardia and GE junction. That's where you have most of the money. So when I'm actually, uh, and I, when I'm doing an endoscopy for varices, uh, if I see no fundic varices, and then I see a little bit of uh, varices along the lesser curve, I actually start uh, just below the G junction in, into the cardia to get those veins as well. And if I don't see any veins going into the cardia along the lesser curve, I go, uh, I go to the biggest vein uh, close to the G junction. I want to get as many of my bands close to the G junction because <clears throat> banding is not one time session, right? If you have big varices. So when you have big varices, I pick the biggest varix and I want to band it very close to the G junction and uh, uh, focus on va one varix and get rid of as many as possible. Once you put a big band on, it's very hard for you to get close to the D junction for other varices. So that's something you have to keep in mind and say to yourself, I will band the high risk varix with the hemocystic spots very close to the G junction. And having said that, if you ablate the distal five centimeters, and when I say distal five centimeters, you should start close to the G junction and then walk up, not uh, five centimeters above and then walking down because you still have perforating veins left there that will refeed. There is another concept that I want to share with you that we, you know, with the banding, uh, when, once the banding became available, people forgot about some of these concepts. Uh, one of the problem is recurrence of varices, right? So they came up with a concept of, uh, after a band ligation, they came up with the concept of how do you obliterate the submucosa? And uh, people have actually uh, used the sclerosins into the submucosa to obliterate the space so that the varices do not come back. So the answer for your question is uh, distal five centimeters. I do not come above that. But if you actually get most of the perforating veins, the big veins are very close to the G, G junction, uh, you will have very little recurrence. And if there are veins that are pale, uh, not blue, but a little bit, uh, maybe grade one to two, above five centimeters, I really do not worry too much about them. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. And the fact that you said you even band below the cardia along the lesser curvature. Um, that's Just interesting. Just below cardia means it's very close to the G junction. Yes, yeah. And generally I would band that only if I found a gastric varix. Right, right, right. I would go below the cardia only right. if that was that situation. Right. Thank you.
All right. I really appreciate you joining. I hope uh, this, I didn't know, actually this is the first time I'm doing anatomy like this. I hope this is useful so that I can actually plan the rest of the anatomy talks based on this. And uh, appreciate your feedback. And I hope Thank you, you all have Rajiv. a nice uh, uh, Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raju. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, enjoy. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, Dr. Roger, are you still there? Yeah. Uh, my name is Amit, I'm a uh, IBD fellow in Canada, but uh, very interested in ferrous esophagus. Can you comment, we at our center with uh, my, my one of my staff, Dr. Wong, we are actually doing like a CMI. So we're also mapping out islands that are outside uh, the classic quad classification. I just wanted to get a sense if you are looking at those and if you're doing anything with those. Uh, I'll tell you, we, we tried to do a study, but there's been a couple of issues because since we're the referral center, they've you know already been mapped in terms of the prog classification. They usually come to us for treatment. So at that point, we're not biopsying islands, but in some situations when we're referred to noble presentations, we are looking at and mapping the islands separately. Um, and then look, we have had a discordance between island histology and prog, classic prog classification histology. And just wanted to know if you encountered that or if you are, have an approach to that. You know, I'm, I'm glad that you, you bring that up. I never thought about it, to be honest with you, but you know, I, I wondered, you know, what do we do with these islands? why Prague did not include the islands. And uh, it makes sense uh, to do that. The only yeah, thing so is, uh, when people are doing that, they have to figure out a way to orient their scope uh, always the same so that the island doesn't change. Yeah, so, and I'll be honest, as a trainee, I don't think I, I never thought of it, but uh, my staff is, he, he's simplified it. He's like, you know, I'm at like, you know, lesser curvature is three o'clock, and then you just base everything off of that. Even our, uh, you know, prog classification, even my M, uh, we give clock positions. So I've, he's, uh, you know, emphasized that. And he says a lot of people aren't doing it well. So he's like, we take biopsies, and we have the luxury actually of taking biopsies, and I, we mark the time and the positions, and then we're, mark, and then we're collecting them separately just because I think that's his focus, but I agree. And I don't think I ever thought of that. So I would say, you know, we do CMI and then I at four, meaning the island is at four o'clock. I assume because they're coming back to me, I understand that the lesser curvature becomes three, but you're right. Most people, he says, are, and I've seen it too, the referrals that come, you know, they're not met properly. You don't have a good sense. And it is a, everybody can't do everything. And he said that, that's why they come to, to him, but uh, yeah, I, I, we, we focus on clock position as well. Yeah, I'm glad that you guys do that. I think you, you are pushing the boundary. I should put it that way. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, if you really audit it now, today, uh, most and uh, every endoscopist in North America, the number of people who actually even use Prague is very low. Oh yeah, uh, you know, we'll have like two biopsies from like a. Right. Uh, you know, like a C four M six, and you're like, <laughs> you know. So sometimes we have to go back and and remap. But he's he says that that you know it's it's just not done well. Right. And so you know our job is either to educate or to do. It. But he say you know we have the luxury of having a lot of time, um, and there's not a rush for the patients to come through. And then on Thursdays it's just Barrett's day. So right. when I'm with him on Thursday, that's all we see. It's just Barrett's, Barrett's, Barrett. So it's it's been very beneficial as a trainee. That's good. I'm okay, glad perfect. that uh, you enjoyed this and hope you have a great uh, Sunday. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Thanks again. See you next week. Okay.